This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to The Self-Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. My guest for this episode is a pretty fascinating guy. His name is Dr. Don Wood, and he's the founder of the Inspired Performance Institute. He works with individuals who have experienced trauma as horrific as being maimed during the Boston Marathon bombings to people who have had their lives painfully impacted by early childhood abuse. He also works with individuals who might not have been confronted by intense trauma, but they've experienced what he calls emotional concussions and explains how these events can subconsciously shape a person's mental models and behaviors throughout life. Dr. Wood believes that some of the assumptions as well as the treatments for trauma are flawed, and his work is inspired by the desire to better understand the effects of trauma on the human brain so that optimal brain functioning can be restored in the aftermath. Cannot tell you how excited I am to have this conversation today, by the way, before we get going. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you for the invitation. I, I'm, I've been looking forward to talking to you as well. So. so in my organization that I'm with now, and I'm not going to get into that, but some of the conversations that come up frequently are around work conducted by people like Folletti and Anda and the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And that contrast, because other organizations that I was working with, you know, kind of like we brought in speakers and it, 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 the position was quite different. Like no matter what's happened to you, you know, whether it's last week or whether it was in your formative years, it's not happening to you now. And the only thing that's wrong is your thinking's broken. And then we look at evidence that, well, there are some things on a psychological and neurophysiological level that do impact us. I would love to get your take. What impact does our childhood have on who we are now and the possibilities for our future? It's amazing how much, when I work with a lot of people, how much stuff comes back to when they were children. And here's what the issue comes in. Like, I grew up in this idyllic childhood. I had very loving, nurturing, unbelievable. I just assumed everybody was living in that world because I didn't know the dysfunction that was going on in my friends' homes. I didn't know that they were getting abused sexually, physically, because people just didn't talk about it. And so I'm assuming that everybody has my parents. What I have discovered is, is a lot of the issues that people are dealing with as adults are coming back to that period of time. And here's why. Because children don't have enough life experience to come up with what's happening to them. So for example, if they're being hurt, they're gonna put a meaning to that. And then that meaning is gonna stick with them as they go through life. That meaning could be the world's not safe, right? I'm not smart enough, right? I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable. All those things, because a child doesn't know what they're experiencing and how to sort of interpret it. So they're gonna put their own interpretation in and chances are they're gonna misinterpret it. And it may not mean that at all. Well, to me, when I hear that, that brings up an issue for me where you're a child and you're gonna misinterpret something and that makes sense. So you're right. gonna attach a meaning, albeit probably an erroneous meaning. Right. But as you start to get older as an adult and you're bumping up against problems that you sincerely are trying to reconcile and you're told things like, well, just change your thinking. As an adult, are we even consciously aware of our interpretation and the belief the world is not safe? Or is this, you know, it's a, a subconscious operating system that just influences how we navigate through the world, but we can't identify exactly what the issue is and therefore think our way out of it. Right. It's happening all on a subconscious level because the conscious mind can use reason and logic, but a six-year-old child has not developed that logic, right? That's still developing. They're probably not going to get to a state till about 25 to 30 years of age before they've really developed that part of their brain. So they're interpreting a whole bunch of events with the limited life experience. 
So if mom and dad are fighting all the time, what does that mean? Well, mom and dad are starting to fall out of love. So if they don't love each other, how long before they stop loving me? I'm not safe. I better make sure that I cooperate or I do whatever, or maybe they rebel, whatever the, the situation. Here's where the issue comes in. And this is what I talk about in our program. When you have those kinds of experiences, your mind filters through them throughout your entire lifetime. Because the way I explain it is that your subconscious mind's operating about 95% of everything. It's taking in all the information in real time. It sends time slices to your consciousness. And it only sends pieces, just like clips from a movie reel. And it's sending those time slices to your conscious mind because your conscious mind could not attend to that much detail. So your subconscious mind comes in, it's called the time slice theory. It's one of the things that I researched. What I did, it was developed by two scientists at the University of Zurich. What is actually happening is when your subconscious mind takes it in, it processes this information and then 400 millionths of a second later, sends it to your consciousness. There's that bit of a delay. And what I say happens in that 400 millionths of a second, it does a Google search. What do we know about this type of an experience? Have we seen it before, heard it before? And so when it goes into memory, it starts pulling up a whole bunch of data from years and years and years throughout your life. And here's where the issue comes in. It's a glitch. Your mind is, your subconscious mind is in the present all the time. It's accessing data from 20 years ago, but when does it think that data is actually happening? Right now in the present. So it creates a physiological response to something that's not happening. All you know is you're in this particular situation. You say, gosh, whenever I get in this situation, I get scared all the time. Your mind's not necessarily scared of this situation, it's scared of all the data that came in that your mind is reliving in real time. Does that make sense? So you encounter a trigger that you're not even aware is a trigger. Yep. And you, your brain takes everything that's happened to you, emotionally charged events, mm -hmm. and cr creates an assessment instantly. instantly. And, and you, you're actually responding to something that happens in such a brief moment in your brain, you couldn't possibly asset, be able to evaluate, is this true? Is it not true? It just occurs and you react. It's instantaneous. So I used to talk about my wife grew up in a very traumatic household. So if I said something like, no, I don't like that, she could tear up and say, why are you upset with me? And I would go, I'm not upset with you at all. What makes you think I'm upset with you? She says, well, the way you said it sounded like you're getting upset. I used to think that it was what I said, and it wasn't what I said. What her mind did when she did the Google search is says, what do we know about men who start to get frustrated? Yep. Frustrated men become angry. And a whole bunch of data about her father would come flooding in, and her nervous system would get so dysregulated because it's now dealing with a flood of data of her being hurt. She wasn't crying about what I said. She was crying because of the flood of data. So when somebody says, well, it's not happening to you now, in a sense, it actually is happening to it you. It is happening now. to your subconscious mind. Yes. Mm, okay. I've and in it in real time. Mm, I, I can relate to that because I interpret neutral facial expressions as being threatening. So when mm -hmm. I was growing up in my household, if my stepfather would read something, I wasn't even aware of what he was reading. He was reading the paper and something really annoyed him. He would somehow connect me as being a source of blame or complicit with what he was reading. And I would be sitting down mind my own business and I would get beaten. So it would, it would be in my mind, unprovoked and unpredictable. I couldn't predict when this was going to happen. Sure. So I, I started basically reading facial expressions. What I started learning how to do is look at my mother. And if she had a look of fear on her face or she looked anxious, I would say, okay, I need to get out of here because yeah. something's been building up that I can't predict. So a lot of times my wife will say, well, why are you getting so upset with this? And I'm looking at something and I'm seeing something that's not there, but in my mind is very real. At this stage, I could look at that in retrospect and go, oh, okay, that never happened. <laughs> so yeah. 
and so that's what's going on for everybody. So if your mind is looking at about a whole bunch of old data about your father and getting beaten, what it's going to do is when it looks for any clues that look like, sound like, smell like that, it's going to be responding. So your wife could say something that doesn't mean exactly what you thought it was, right? Mm -hmm. And so your mind's going into that fight or flight response. And, you, and you're thinking it's your wife. And it's not your wife, it's all the data, the old data that's activating your nervous system. Because I couldn't understand how I said, you know, I love my wife. How is she getting, you know, these kind of reactions? She's not unsafe. I've never yelled at my wife, obviously never touched or hit my wife. Yet she's in fear. That made no sense to me. I couldn't understand why is this happening? So I tried to choose my words differently. I tried to be even calmer. I was doing everything I could, but I could still do it. And until I understood why it's happening, I couldn't fix it. Well, the question has to be, how do we, how do we overcome that? Because that presents challenges, not only to the people around us, it, it, it's a painful and often frustrating way to go through life. Sometimes it can leave you helpless. If you're in that situation, what do you do? That's the great part. We can fix it but the current system will teach you how to live and manage and cope with it. Got anxiety, you have anger issues, whatever it is. Okay, we're gonna teach you how to manage that, get it under some sort of control. And what I say is, no, let's fix it. We don't need to manage it. Here's where the issue is coming in. That memory that's activating your nervous system has been stored in high definition, very bright, very intense. That's what's activating your nervous system. Because when you're in a traumatic event, all your senses are heightened, sight, smell, hearing. So it's taking in tremendous amounts of detail in high definition and storing it in memory. If something gets your mind to start looking at that old data, doing that Google search, and it starts now looking at that images, those data, what's it gonna think? We're in danger. So it's going to create a physiological response. Your heart's going to start racing. Everything's going to start happening. And you're going to relate it to what's happening now. But it's not what's happening now. It's all the other things. So, for example, somebody cuts you off in traffic, right? So your first response is, oh, I'm going to chase the guy down, give him a piece of my mind. We have a part of our frontal lobe, right? Our, our lateral ventral prefrontal cortex. That is our impulse control. They can say, well, hold on, let's use some reason and logic here. Maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe they just didn't see us. Maybe I got in this blind spot. We can control that impulse. Here's the problem. If that event was interpreted by your mind as somebody was disrespecting you, mm -hmm. then what happens is a flood of data of all the times you've been disrespected comes in and you chase the guy down and you're, and you're willing to get into a fight with him not because if he just cut you off. Especially if the times that you were disrespected was interpreted as a legitimate threat and that happened over and over. And you, yep. let's say, maybe have a little bit of a lower excitation threshold in your amygdala and you interpret that as a threat and it doesn't really take much. I've developed, like where I live, you know, I get cut off all the time. I've developed what I think is a, is a pretty constructive strategy. I diffuse the situation by speeding up alongside the person. I just simply stick my hand out the window and gesture to them that I think they're number one. And then <laughs> they gesture back to me that they think I'm number one as well. And we're both happy. We're encouraged. We go about our day. So I don't know if that's an effective coping strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. Probably not. But you can see why it can happen so easily, right? Because the mind is feeling threatened. And if there's a threat, it's going to respond. But unfortunately, it's responding to a whole bunch of old data. Now, if you had never been disrespected in your life, never had that kind of an issue, chances are you may have initially went, oh, boy, that guy, I can't believe he just did that. But you would calm down because there wasn't a whole bunch of data to read. Yeah, I mean, that's great for the Canadians. But, that's you know, right. for, for right. <laughs> so. no, we're hockey players. Yeah, but, 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 but other than that, like out and about, like really like respectful group of people, you know, yeah. very rarely do you run into an obnoxious or angry Canadian. So, yeah. you know, and, and if you do, they're very sorry about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> <Right on. laughs> 
Yeah. So it, it, going back to the being cut off scenario, I react the way I react when I get cut off and it's maybe not the most constructive. I get to my destination. I calm down and I think in retrospect, wow, okay, what actually happened? How did I respond? Yeah, that, that wasn't the best response for me. You know, right. But what about when you're in those moments? Because, because if, if you're using reasoning, those are different centers of the brain, obviously, then when you're in a state of intense emotional reaction, what do you do about that? And how, how do you get to the underlying root causes and, and start to move forward a little bit to where you're not controlled by incidents like that because of the influence of things that have happened to you that have conditioned you to respond in that moment of time, if that makes sense. Yep. No, it makes perfect sense. So the whole idea is, is when we have a traumatic event, it's stored in high definition, high resolution. That's why the mind it's in a beta brainwave state, very active, tons of data coming in. So if I asked you what you ate for dinner last night, can you tell me what you ate for dinner? Yes, I can. I can tell you what I ate for dinner. Yeah, what'd you have? I had, I had chicken and rice. How boring is that? I was, <laughs> it's not a great answer, is it? Well, that's actually, no, it's really good. Because when I asked you that, when you look back at this recording, you'll see that you looked up, right? Mm -hmm. And you saw pictures, right, of what you ate. Yeah, right? which was not that rewarding of an image, but I did. No, but you saw pictures <laughs> maybe even where you were. That's mm -hmm. how you stored the information about dinner last night. Now, because it wasn't threatening or disturbing, it was stored as a fairly routine file not a lot of data to it. Had that been a disturbing event, your mind is in a very, very active state, a hyper aroused state. So it's bringing in a lot more information. You would have recorded mm -hmm. everybody that you interacted with during that meal, right? All the sounds in that room, everything would have been recorded. So what we're going, what we do in our program- That is would I have been tofu and rice. Right. <laughs> I'm going to take you through a program where what we're going to do is we're going to get your mind to reprocess that high definition data into the same format as to what you ate for dinner last night. And we can do that very quickly. How do you and do that? Calling for the action. It's amazing. The mind's designed to heal. What's interfering with it healing is it's in a constant fight or flight state. So it doesn't want to do that maintenance. So we take you through a four hour program that gets you into a very relaxed, focused alpha brainwave state. And then I'll have you bring in a two to three minute highlight reel of one of those beta high definition memories. Mm -hmm. Because you're in an alpha brainwave state and very relaxed and focused, it'll reprocess it into that state. It takes all that intensity out of it. So like my wife is, is a filmmaker. So mm -hmm. she pulled up a file from an old film Right. And it got somehow it got distorted and it, it no longer, it, it no longer creates the same coherent story. Could that be an analogy where you are like disrupting and distorting that old pattern of that old recording and, and, and kind of recording over it? Yes. That so it's sort of basically we're doing the opposite of what they did with the wizard of Oz, taking it from black and white to color. We're going the other way. We're going to take it from color into black and white, just a, the same kind of an analogy. We're taking that intensity out of it. It doesn't look as bright. It's not as intense. The mind doesn't feel the threat, right? And you can, so I've worked with some of the most horrific kinds of traumas, Boston marathons, Vegas shooting victims, right? Military. By the time we do a two to three minute exercise, they stop shaking and crying. They can talk about it without any emotion. The only reason you have an emotion is it's a call for an action. The purpose of fear is to escape. The purpose of anger is to attack. So if you think about something that happened to you 10 years ago and your heart starts pounding in your chest, what is your mind asking you to do? Run mm -hmm. from something 10 years ago. That's a glitch. That's an error message. And only humans can do this. Animals don't have the ability to do that. They don't store that memory that way. So humans are constantly getting activated. And the more you get activated, the more your nervous system gets dysregulated, the less time you're staying present, that's going to affect the way you live, not only on your mental health, but your physical health. So a lot of people go have autoimmune issues because they're constantly in this fight or flight state. My wife did. 
she developed Hashimoto's, which is a thyroid mm -hmm. disorder where she's constantly producing cortisol because she was always scared. And that's why I said, so if I said, no, I don't like that, she'd tear up. And I'm like, how could that tear you up? And it wasn't how, you, you know, it wasn't what I said, it was all the activation of the old memory. Because her mind and her as a child, she had learned to listen very, very carefully, just like you were talking about. You were looking for clues and cues as to when danger was coming. So she could hear it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So people who have been traumatized as children are highly sensitive to sound. And so when I would say, no, I don't like that, she would hear, no, I don't like that. And I'd go, but I didn't say it like that. She'd go, yes, you did. She'd go, you were getting upset with me. And I said, well, now I'm getting upset because you accused <laughs> me of something I didn't do. It sounds like me and my wife in reverse. Yeah. But I could not calm it down right and i couldn't understand why she was thinking that she couldn't understand why i didn't understand why she thought i was upset it was because in her mind i was getting upset and in my you could have paid me you could have taken two recordings of me perfectly calm and saying that same statement in that moment i would never been able to tell the difference yet she could tell exactly that the, I, and I could have been a little frustrated at work that day or in the drive home where maybe you cut me off or something, right? But never. <laughs> so, but I have that little frustration. I'm not upset at her, right? But that I haven't quite calmed down yet or just gotten to that really relaxed state. She could hear that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I could see the, the frustration that, you know, Robert Sapolsky, had said something, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but I thought it was spot on where you better be very careful and you better think and you better pause before you come to the conclusion that you understand why an individual is engaging in a specific behavior. You know, and then he goes on to say, especially if you have some form of negative judgment around that behavior and you know he says a couple of other really bright things as in my mind he always does and then he just says look it's complicated and it, it, it I, I i so connect with that sentiment it, if i could take you back you know you, someone who was in a situation like i know that i lived i lived at ground zero during 9 11 um that was an unexpected on it, like, how would you anticipate that? And that was a very interesting situation to be in. Um, o -o -o almost surreal, luckily at some points. What did people going through the, the, the Boston Marathon attacks, like what were some of the things you saw there? I'm just I'm very interested in that. Well, I worked with a lady, she was three feet from the first bomb that went off mm. and her son was sitting at her feet. So when the bomb hit her, she took the brunt of the blast. She really saved his life, but she ended up losing her left leg, um, actually just below the knee. And so when she first sat down, started talking to me, she started to shake and cry. And I said, do you know why you're shaking and crying right now? And she says, well, because I'm talking about what happened to me. I said, right, but your mind thinks there's a bomb about to go off as you're talking about it, as trying to protect you. I says, there's no bomb going off and your mind doesn't know that. So what we have to do is update your mind. So by the time we took her through the program, she was suffering from post-traumatic stress for five years. She had terror nightmares every night. After I took her through the program, she hasn't had any nightmares and no more post-traumatic stress. She went back to the sixth anniversary of the Boston Marathon and said, I'm going to stand exactly where I was when that bomb went off at the exact time the bells go off at that time. And she sent me a picture and said, this wouldn't be possible. I could not have stood here without crying. And she says, and I've just got tears of joy. I'm no longer activated by that at all. It's wow, a that glitch. is enormous. It's a glitch. I worked with a U.S. Army sniper who had to shoot and kill a 12-year-old boy. And so he was just sobbing. said, I can't talk about this anymore. I can't live with myself. By the time I was finished, he could give me a complete detailed description of everything that happened that day, including shooting the boy. And he said to me, he goes, I'm not shaking. I'm not crying. He goes, how the bleep did you do this? And I says, I didn't do anything for eight years. Your mind has been trying to get you not to pull the trigger because that would solve it. It's been calling for an action that's not possible. 
that's going to stress out your entire system. Calling for an action that's not possible. Right. Can't not pull the trigger. Rebecca could not get away from a bomb five years earlier. Right. That's what your mind keeps calling for. So you can imagine if that action keeps getting called for, you don't answer the call. What's going to happen? Stress out your system. So people are getting, so when people go into depression, what I'll say to them is, what are you angry about? And they'll say, well, I'm not angry, I'm depressed. And I say, yeah, your mind's been asking for an action. It's been trying to get you angry to do something about somebody maybe who hurt you or did something. Because you can't do it and you didn't do it, your mind then shuts down to protect you. Depression is the absence of an emotion. It stops calling for the action. And it goes into depression because that's the way to protect you. Mm -hmm. When people tell me that they sabotage themselves, I say it's impossible. Your brain is not capable of sabotage. It's designed to survive. And at all costs, it will survive. So you're at 9-11. So why were people jumping out of the building at 9-11? They weren't jumping to die. They were jumping because if they, if they didn't jump, they were going to die now. And your subconscious is only responsible for now. So it wants to stop the pain now. So when they jump, they succeeded in living, even if it was only for a short little time. The reason and logic of your intellect, right? Your more advanced part of your brain is completely overridden by the survival brain. So it makes no sense jumping out of building makes any sense at all to live. But in the subconscious mind, I will die if I don't jump. My physiology just changed. Like I just, I just felt my, my respiratory patterns just completely alter when you said that. And yep. just looking back to how that felt, you know, I didn't see people jumping, um, but right. watching that after the fact and seeing that, or, or well, actually I did, but on like early on on TV, I wasn't yep. home when that happened, I was, I was in midtown Manhattan about to go to Washington for a seminar. And, um, I had to, I, I had to go back home and what, what you, what my home used to look like was a little bit different, obviously, but we were watching that on the TV at right. the office at work. And I remember that feeling. And when you just said that, I was like, it, it just took me back there a little bit. Yeah, because what your mind was doing is a Google search. What do we know about what this guy's talking about? And it started looking at a whole bunch of data about that time. And then you were getting a response because your mind is not okay with this unresolved issue. It wants you to make it stop. Don't let it happen. Why did, why did we allow that plane to crash? Why didn't we do something about it? What could we have done? Your mind's calling for actions all the time. And because you can't do the action, your mind will keep calling for it. So you can see where people are getting post-traumatic stress, they're getting anxiety, they're getting depression. All these things are being caused by this glitch, this error message. And I know you, you can't describe within like a couple of minutes, like something that you do within hours. That's one of the most annoying things as a presenter, by the way, <laughs> I could relate to you. Like a four hours, well, well, could, could you just say something in 15 minutes, just the bullet points? It's like, oh. Okay. Yeah. There'll be yeah. no context or, or relevance, but yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but you said like within two to three minutes, mm -hmm. like you can help someone make a notable level of progress. Could you share anything about what happens in those two to three minutes? That's really impactful. Yeah. Here's a good way of explaining it. So I worked with Dr. Ben Hardy. He's the number one blogger on medium.com. He writes for psychology today he said, I want to go through the program so I can better understand it, so I can write about it. So when he came in to see me, he loved this explanation. I said, when we have a traumatic event, our brain is in a very active, right, hyper aroused state, which is beta, beta brain waves, right, are the dominant state. So when that is recorded in beta, while I take you through this four hour process, you're moving into an alpha brain wave state very relaxed, very focused. We haven't even talked about a trauma yet. So we don't even get into the traumas till well after two hours of the program. I'm giving you all the education and the science behind it first. Mm -hmm. Because once you understand 
What, you're going to ask something? No, I, I was like, well, wh wh why do you start with the science? I thought that was it. You, you were just explaining that. So sorry yeah. about that. No, no problem. So the reason I do that is because I want you to understand that this is not that complicated. There's a science behind why your mind's doing what it's doing. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken, right? You don't have anxiety. That's a symptom. There's a reason why you're experiencing that. There's a reason why your brain is doing everything. So once I give you the science that this is just a series of glitches and error messages that your mind is asking for something to be done because it's seeing this in real time, all we have to do is update it. It's like a computer. So we're going to reboot the computer so it stops calling for the actions. Your mind is very capable of doing that. The reason why you haven't been able to do it is because every time you think about it or talk about it, what state do you go into? A hyperarousal state. Your mind is not going to fix a hyperarousal memory in a hyperaroused state. So mm -hmm. when I keep you for a couple of hours talking about science, talking about stories, symbols, metaphors, all built to communicate with the subconscious part of the mind, then I say, okay, let's now take a two to three minute highlight reel of an event or an experience that was disturbing to you. And your mind is so relaxed and peaceful that this beta memory that's very high active the dominant brain waves at this point are alpha. And so as you recall a minute, two minutes, three minutes of that, it comes back in and aligns and reprocesses in that alpha brainwave state. Takes all the intensity out of it. By the time we're finished, they can describe it and talk about it. So when you describe why you do what you do and mm -hmm. where you start and why you stay there for so long, it makes complete sense to me. It's yeah. like, okay, that makes sense. Not, not within the application of it. I'm not a practitioner, but within the, within the context of working with people in other domains and other areas, it's like, yeah, that, 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 that would work. And that's why Ben Hardy, that's what he said. He goes, I've never heard anybody explain it that, that way. He said the same thing. That's the most common thing I heard. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Of course it would do that. Hollywood has made, you said your wife's a uh, producer? She's No, she's a filmmaker. I mean, sometimes she wears that hat, but yeah. So, so she's a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Hollywood and your wife have made trillions of dollars from being able to convince our brain that something is happening on a screen. It cannot determine that on that screen, that is not real. That's what memory's doing. So your conscious, logical, reasonable part of your mind is saying, oh, that's that actor, Leonardo DiCaprio, playing in a movie called Titanic. And your subconscious survival brain is saying, oh, my God, Jack's drowning. And they're not doing mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're spot on, except the when you said my wife made trillions. I wish. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I, I, I always say that the, the sign of a mediocre film is when you walk out and you say, oh, that actor had such a great performance. Right. If you're connected to that actor and that performance, that was not a great film and it was not a great performance. When you walk out there and you suspended complete disbelief and you were immersed in the storyline to where it was real and you're like, I feel, and your focus is on your state post-film, that's a great film. That's yeah. transformative. That's art. I agree, 100%. And, but that, because our minds are capable of doing that, can you see how memory does the same thing? Mm -hmm. So if you just went to a movie that was scary and you came out of there and you were like, oh my gosh, that was unbelievable. I was scared out of my wits. They did a great job, right? But if you went to a scary movie and they didn't scare you, the subconscious mind, right, did not engage at all. And the conscious mind said that movie really was pretty lame. So that's what happens. So memory is creating the same thing that the movie is. It's creating a response, a reaction to something that looks real. You're, you suspend belief, right? A dog's not dying. It's a dog mm -hmm. acting like it's dying. But your mind doesn't know that. And that's why you'll cry. You know, when, when we talk about communication and we talk about how the way we feel enables us to process and engage with ourselves and others, you know, can, we, can we talk about COVID for a little bit? Sure. So we've completely changed the way that we interact. Like, look at how we're interacting right now. 
this is like my sixth interaction this day like this. And it's not the last one where right. normally I would be face to face with people. Yep. I would be more immersed. What are some of the consequences and, and, and maybe not negative consequences, but positive consequences as well. Post COVID. What, what do you think it's going to be like to function in a post COVID world? And some are, what are some things that we might not realize about what that world is going to look like and feel like for us? I think eventually things will go back to fairly normal. Uh, right now we can't because it's still too, uh, you know, top of mind. But again, you'll go back to 9-11, you know, for the first little while, it was like we were hyper vigilant. You got on a plane, you're thinking about, uh-oh, I'm going to check out everybody on this plane. Now you got on a plane, you don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. But eventually, you know, so we have taken some precautions and we're probably a lot more aware of what could go wrong. So now we got a lot more safety measures. But eventually things will go back to a fairly similar uh, state. Here's where I think the issue is going to come in, though. I think we're coming up to a tsunami of mental health issues. And here's mm -hmm. why. Because during COVID, we have really three responses. You have fight, flight, or freeze. I think we have all gone into a freeze state. Just get through this, right? Don't challenge it. Don't question it. Just put on the mask. Don't go out. Do everything right. And so we're in this sort of flat, right? It will eventually end. I just need to get through this. And I don't rock the boat. I just go along. I comply. That free state, when people come out of it, you're going to see a lot of anger about why did this happen? Who's responsible for creating me to lose my job or lose income? All those kinds of things. My life has changed. When we come out of freeze, you're going to start seeing a lot of issues, depression, anger, anxiety about it's going to come back. Right now, a lot of people are numb because they've never experienced mm -hmm. this before. When that numbness goes away, look out and it's coming. That's what I really see. That, that is troublesome. So, I mean, there are people who are more, I, I think, in touch with the fact that they are struggling, even though they don't know exactly how that shows up or what the true source of that struggle is. They, they chunk it into, well, it's COVID, but there might be certain triggers. If you're someone who knows that you're struggling in the moment and this is probably going to get worse post COVID. What are some of the things that you can kind of do preemptively to minimize that? Well, it's really, you probably want to get some help because that's a current stress. So especially what our program is really good at is getting rid of those old stressors that are activating your nervous system. This is where counseling is good. You know, therapy mm -hmm. is good because it helps you sort of manage, right? How to deal with that. If you get rid of the things that used to activate you before, therapy is going to be a lot more effective because you'll be able to deal with it easier. So what you're saying is that if you are struggling at a level where you are having a hard time coping and functioning day to day, you are going to require med medical intervention or seek out a medical professional. Right. Right. Okay. So, I just want to, I just want to be very clear somebody to talk on that. To, somebody that mm -hmm. can then help you sort of see it and frame it in the proper, you know, this is going to end one day, right? You're not going to be in this state forever, right? Let's take a look at what positives we can take from this kind of an event. So you need somebody to help you reframe all of that. If you don't, you could then just like we talked about as children, we could put a whole bunch of meanings attached to this. What does this mean about me? They laid me off. I'm not good enough, right? Why wouldn't they keep me? They kept George, they didn't keep me, right? So a whole bunch of stuff comes in our minds attached meaning. Same erroneous attachment of meaning and operating as if that were true. Yep, yep. And that's what I see is gonna be another issue. Why did this happen to me? I hear that all the time. Why me? Why didn't this, you know, I got COVID. I did everything right. I wore the mask. I did everything carefully. Why me, mm -hmm. right? And so those then start to build up and it'll create a lot of, you know, mental health issues. That's where you need to have somebody that you can just say, 
all right, let me just throw this all out there and help me organize it. I need somebody to sort of put this into some perspective for me. That, that's where therapy is very good. What it's not really good at is dealing with the old traumas because it actually makes you continually relive them and re-traumatize yourself. So get that out of the way and then therapy becomes very effective. And thank you for that because that's, very, that's a very important point. You know, one of the things I've noticed in any domain, in any area of expertise, and for me, expertise is the formation of distinctions. It's just as having a lot of knowledge and knowing about stuff. It's being able to discern relevant nuances and attach what do they mean and what do I do? You know, so if, you, if, if you're hiking through, you know, a, a treacherous terrain, let's say, you can have people who know a lot about the terrain. They've read a lot about it, or you can hike with someone who has distinctions like don't step there. You'll lose your footing, you know, eat that berry. It's good for you. That berry will kill you. And they can spot it out straight away and and they can give you usable direction from that. To me, that's the definition of expertise. And what I've seen across multiple industries is the greater someone's level of expertise is the wider their filter is. Things are not as definitive. They're not like, this is black, this is white. This happens for this reason. That there, there becomes this willingness to live in the question and not this, this presupposition to just jump into the answer. And, and I think for a lot of people, it behooves them to deepen their understanding around some of the sciences that you're talking about to get a better understanding of themselves. You know, so they're not, they're not predisposed to arriving at a conclusion like, well, something must just be wrong with me, or I need to do this or get my shit together. No, there, there might be reasons that you don't appreciate that, yeah. you, you know, there, there might not be anyone to blame here, even though it's your responsibility to take a look at where you are and, sure. and solve for that. It's not really a blame. So, you know, as we're wrapping up, what are some resources that you can recommend? You know, what are some of your books? Where can, where can we learn more about what you do, the science behind it? I I want to share one thing first before we get there, and then I'll get into the book, please. One of the things that I always talk, just what you were talking about, that's really, really good to talk about because the more skill you have, the more experience you have, obviously, the better you're going to be able to handle a situation. I look at it and and use it this way. Think about a deck of cards, 52 cards. The more experience you have, the more cards you have to play. So if you get into a Mm. poker team, right? And you've only got three cards, right? And the other guy's got 10 cards, right? The odds of you being able to beat that guy or come out with a better outcome, right? Are pretty dismal in your favor. Right. So the more expertise, the more ability you have, right, to play more cards, right, which is going to bring a sense of, wow, great analogy. This, right. And then the other one I really like to talk about too is Annie Duke. Have you ever heard of Annie Duke, the uh, poker player, the female poker player? No. no. I love what she said. She said the key to being a great poker player, and th- you could apply this to life. And she says, I had to develop an attitude of being outcome blind. And she says, and what I meant by outcome blind was if I lost a hand, right? I had to look at it as I knew what I had in my hand. I knew what cards are being played, but I don't know what the other players have. And I don't know what's still in the deck. So based on what I do know, I have to make my best assumption that my hand is either good or bad and make my decision. And she says, and if it turned out that I lost, she says, I was blind to the outcome because I didn't have all the data. I can only do so much. So I have to make my best calculation based on what I know. And if you apply that to life, you know, something goes wrong. You can just say, I didn't know that that guy was going to do that, or that guy was going to rip me off, or that guy was going to quit in the middle of the job, right? So all the different things that you didn't know If you start analyzing, thinking, "Uh oh, what I do wrong, what I do wrong, I need to make a mistake, let it go, move on to the next hand, right? Be outcome blind. That is stupendous. Don't you love that? 
I absolutely resonate strongly with that. Yeah. So that's a really powerful thing. That's what I use as part of when I'm, you know, going through our program. And then back to our books. The very first book I wrote is called You Must Be Out of Your Mind. So the <laughs> idea is to get you out of your mind the way it's been operating, right? And I talk about how I developed the program, what my life, my wife's life, and a whole bunch of different stories about people, what we have done, and how we accomplished what we did. So the, how the program works. The second book I wrote is because I'd meet a lot of people who they would say, you know, oh, wow, I saw all these unbelievable Vegas shooting victims, you know, Boston Marathon. I don't have anything like that. I've never experienced any kind of trauma like that. So what I started saying is, those are what you're describing to me are emotional concussions. They're not big T traumas, but they're emotional concussions. The coach that told you you're not, you're not going to ever make it. You know, the teacher that told you you're stupid. Those emotional concussions can have just as big an impact on you later on in your life if you don't resolve them. They're going to show up in a behavior. So maybe you're the type of person who blames everybody for when something goes wrong. That's coming from an emotional concussion that maybe you got constantly criticized, right? You could never get anything right. You know, so maybe you had a parent that was overly critical. And so now when something goes wrong, you don't want to take responsibility. So it's somebody else's fault. That avoids the pain of the criticism from mom or dad or whatever it is. Our mind seeks to be away from pain. So I read a story, this is a really interesting story about a German sniper during World War II. And he said, when they fought against the Russians on the Russian front, the Russians had very little weapons. He says, but they had lots of people. Mm -hmm. So their strategy was to storm the Russian bunkers and to storm their fronts, just trying to overwhelm them with sheer force and numbers, but no real weapons. He says, so the sniper said, my job was to shoot them. And he says, but we would shoot them and then another wave would come. We'd shoot him again, another wave would come. He says, and then I figured out a way to stop them. He says, I started shooting them in the stomach. Because when the next wave would come, they would see all their comrades lying on the ground, screaming in pain and being in agony. That was a bigger deterrent. They did not want to be in pain. Hmm. Death stops the pain. So when people say, oh, you know, somebody committed suicide, you know, the, you know, what happened? I said, it was the only resource they had to stop the pain. They didn't want to die. They just wanted to stop the pain. That pain is a very, very dominant, you know, process for us. And the mind tries to avoid pain at all costs. That's why I say people don't sabotage themselves. They work around the pain to come up with another way so that they won't run into pain. And then it looks like sabotage because they say, well, it doesn't make any sense. Why would I go and do something like that? So stupid because your mindset, if you continue on this track, we're going to get hurt. And, and that is a perfect example of distinctions. Mm -hmm. Very useful. Yeah. So I, I just want to say thank you for everything that you shared with us. Well, I appreciate it. I always appreciate the opportunity to share with, with people because we're, we're passionate and excited about it. There's nothing wrong with anybody. Everybody's mind works perfectly fine. Let's just get it fixed. Don't manage and cope with it and live with it. Brilliant. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore.